Well, good evening. Nice to be, nice to be together. Welcome to those who are joining us from home. Uh, we're going to be thinking about Jonah this evening. I guess this may be familiar territory, like I said this morning on justification by faith. But nevertheless, it's good to remind ourselves of certain principles from the life of Jonah that I hope to bring out, that I hope that we'll be able to apply uh, by the Spirit to our own lives. Um, in the light of that, let me just read to you uh, these words from Hebrews 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, we're going to start by singing the hymn number 63. It's a hymn of gratitude to all that God is and all that the God has done and is continuing to do for our, for our lives. It's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord as we were reminded this morning, 63, let's sing uh, uh, gladly this hymn uh, to him. Oh, 
welcome to everyone to our evening service. Our preacher again this evening is John, Pastor John Woolen of Newhouse Baptist Church near Honiton. And we do thank you, John, for coming amongst us uh, today. And then after the service, there'll be refreshments here. And then also this evening, there'll be extra time at uh, Alison and Julian's home. On Wednesday at 7.30 is our prayer and Bible study meeting, and this will be led by our missionary brother, Richard Tossel. And then on Thursday, there'll be an officer's prayer meeting online at 7.30. Uh, and then again, uh, being a holiday week, there'll be no Tiger Tots or Lighthouse on Friday. And then our services next Sunday are at the usual times, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. And the speaker will be Roger Hitchings from Swindon. And just a reminder again, there are vacancies on the church cleaning rotor, so if you think you can help, please see James. And on Monday the 29th of August, there's going to be a bank holiday out outing to Blaze Castle. Again, please see James if you are interested. And then finally, please let the church officers know if you need any help. Contact details on the church website. Thank you. Let's commend our time to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us this evening as we consider his servant from the past. Lord, we do thank you for all the way you have had your hand upon us from the very beginning of our lives, that we can say in you we live and move and have our being. And as we look upon the gifts that you have given to us day by day, that your tender mercies have been over us, we thank you that indeed you are a kind and gracious God. You are the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. We thank you that you are truly God and that you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have created us for yourself, formed us for your glory. And we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to a realization of that, of what it really means to live life to the full. We thank you for uh, reminding us this morning of sins forgiven and peace with God and the righteousness from heaven that comes to us through your beloved Son. We thank you that we are, by your mercy, the recipients of all these good things, and we just want to give you thanks and to pray that we might know amongst us this evening that work of the Spirit that comes and who ministers to our heart, who brings conviction and who brings comfort. And we pray, Spirit of God, be our teacher, showing to us the things of God, the things of Christ, and those things that concern our great and glorious salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the book of Jonah is not always an easy book to find, certainly not for me, so I'm glad I just had the opportunity at the beginning of the notices to go looking for the page so I could announce it from uh, uh, the Pew uh, New King James Bible. So it's on page 816. 816. And please bear with me because it's my aim this evening to actually read to you the whole book. Um, it's not that long and I'll divide it into two parts. But really what I want to do this evening is to give an overview of the book, not going to say everything about it, but to bring out things that I think are relevant to us as Christians uh, in, our, in our lives. And it has a gospel challenge at the same time. So what, what, what I propose to do, we're going to read the first two chapters, I'll read the first two chapters, we'll take a break and have another hymn, and then we'll resume the last two. So the book of Jonah and verse one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, 
for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose and f- to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Well, we'll pause there and we'll pick up our hymn books again to sing Gadsby's lovely hymn, many Christians' favourite hymn, 125, Immortal Honours Rest on Jesus' Head, My God, My Portion, and My Living Bread. In Him I live, upon Him cast my care. He saves from death, destruction, and despair. In Him I live. I think we understand that primarily as a spiritual engagement with him. In him I live. That's where I am. That's where I am spiritually. I'm in him if I'm a Christian. And that's where we live. That's where we draw from him to live out our Christian lives in sweet fellowship, immortal honours.
So we resume our reading in the book of Jonah, and we pick up at the beginning of chapter 3. Jonah has been swallowed by the great fish, and he has been dealt with by the Lord in the belly of that great fish. And now he's coming back to the Lord. And now a commission that he had not done and fulfilled before now is carried out. So chapter 3, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he didn't do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I knew you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning drew the next day, God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Well, may the Lord grant us some measure of understanding of that passage which will speak to us and be applied to our circumstances tonight. So let's, uh, let's come before God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the reality of your being and we believe we thank you too for the reality of your presence. For you have said to your people that I am with you always even to the end of the age. And we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ that becomes very, very, a very sobering and very uplifting uh, presence and promise for us. And Lord, we ask that you would be gracious to us this evening as we come together. We desire to know you. We desire to know you better. 
We desire that our, our lives might be conformed more to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might grow in him and in grace and in his knowledge. O oh Lord, may your word do its effect amongst us. Your word has been given to us that we may be equipped to live the Christian life, that we might become the men and women of God that you have called us to be. And grant us therefore, as our Lord Jesus Christ prayed, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. We are here as, as your eager servants and we come with ears open to hear your voice. And grant that we may hear the Spirit's voice speaking to us as we consider this servant of yours of old. And as we consider him, we see something of ourselves in his character, in his ways, in his waywardness. And we see something also of your, of your, your kind discipline to Jonah that uh, corrects him, chastens him, and brings him back. Your mercies were not withdrawn from him, and you made him to be a man after your own heart. You made him to be an equipped servant to preach the word to a pagan city. Lord, that would be our prayer, that you would make us to become like the Lord Jesus and to give us a heart that is like his own heart for the lost. Lord, we are weak, but you are mighty. We are sinful, but you are forgiving. O oh Lord, do, do that work amongst us. Speak to us all. Grant your blessing upon this fellowship. Thank you for uh, the encouragements of this fellowship. Thank you for those who regularly come. Thanks for those who come uh, as passers-by, as it were, and come in. We pray that these chance meetings, as it were, might become significant as people hear the word of God and the gospel to bring them to a knowledge of the truth. We remember Oliver and his wife and family as they have this holiday. We pray that you will physically refresh them, mentally uh, 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 refresh them, and spiritually lift them up and do them good. And we pray these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to have been with you today. Uh, I'm still struggling with the hearing a bit, but that doesn't matter. As long as you can hear me, you can hear me, yes? Okay. Well, um, we're going to, we're going to uh, sing again, and uh, the hymn is 350, 350. Jesus, we thy promise claim. We are gathered in thy name. In the midst do thou appear, manifest thy presence here.
there's something important that I want to say right at the beginning of this study on Jonah. It's a simple statement, it's an obvious statement, and it's a statement which makes the prophecy of Jonah different from all the other prophets, major and minor. When you look at the other prophets, major and minor, the focus is on the message. The message. What the prophets are called by God to give, whether it's to the northern kingdom of Israel or the southern kingdom of Judah. Jonah is different because it's not about the message. It's about the messenger. Now that's important because when you read this prophecy, you're confronted with a servant of God who was a reluctant servant of God. We are studying an example of a Christian, a believer, who was flawed. And therefore, when we come to this passage, we don't do so as spectators. We do so as those who are involved. Because if we are sensitive to our own spiritual condition, and we do an analogy between ourselves and Jonah, we say, I'm not really any different to Jonah. So therefore, the prophecy is not just about Jonah, it's about you and me. And if it's not about you and me, then this book, this prophecy, is not a living word. It has no present practical relevance to us apart from being an historical account, account of what happened in the history of God's people long, long ago. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, reproof and correction that the man and the woman of God may be equipped uh, enabled to do what the Lord has called him or her to do. So can we bear in mind right at the outset, it's about you and me. It's about Jonah, but it's about you and me. And it's also about God's dealings with Jonah. And how Jonah has to deal with him strictly, severely, but with the ultimate purpose of restoring him into his service. If Christ went to all lengths to make you his child, and I'm assuming that you are all his children this evening, that you have come to know him whom to know is life everlasting, if Christ has gone to all this trouble to make you his own, it means surely that he will continue to go to enormous trouble to make sure you become the followers of his with a heart for him. And we therefore have to say, Lord, in what way am I like Jonah? In what way do I need restoring? How can I be more useful in your service? So we are going to have an overview. I'll remind you of the, the background firstly. And we'll be confronted in the first chapter with a reluctant prophet. It's possible for Christians to be reluctant to follow on to do God's work and God's will. Jonah was a Jew and he was a converted Jew. Under the old economy, he came into an experience 
of saving grace, we'll see him in glory. The prophet from, from Amittai, from, he was the son of Amittai, who um, had come to, I'm reading from verse 1 of chapter 1, who had come to know the Lord. We can say that, let me just say this very quickly, we can say that because he was already in service for the Lord as his spokesperson. Under the, under the realm of the, one of the northern kings, Jeroboam, he had been the means of conveying mercy to the people who lived in Samaria to tell them that although inroads had been made into their kingdom by foreigners, those borders would be restored. So in the midst of God's judgment to the northern kingdom, there was also a message of grace and kindness and restoration. And Jonah was the mouthpiece for that message under the reign of Jeroboam. So in the midst of the darkness, a light was shining in the life and service of Jonah. So he had a good track record. But having heard a series on this many years ago by Sinclair Ferguson, Sinclair Ferguson said, past obedience is never a guarantee for present compliance. And we say amen, not in any kind of rejoicing way, but to affirm that from our own experience. Now the word of the Lord comes to Jonah again. And he is to go to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians, who were notorious for their cruelty, who were a bugbear to the northern kingdom, who were, who were, who were thorns in their side. And he was to go to them to pronounce a message of judgment. That's what he was called to do. A message of judgment that might actually lead to mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. And in his wrath towards the Assyrians, he remembered mercy. Jonah, go. He was a recipient of that mercy. Now he was going to proclaim a message that potentially would extend mercy to these other people. Do you remember the Assyrians and the poem? I'm not going to quote it because I can't quote it. By Lord Byron about the wolf coming out from the fold, is it? Coming down. Do some of you know this? Do you know the poem, any of you? The wolf came down. Can you come and tell me afterwards? <laughs> Notorious for their cruelty. Jonah didn't go. He didn't want to go. And we're told in chapter 4 why he didn't want to go. It was in case God extended to these terrible people, as he would view them, kindness, mercy, pardon, and restoration. And in case that happened, he went in the opposite direction, to Tarshish. And providentially, there was a boat waiting for him to go, and he put his hand in his pocket, and he had the fare to pay. So everything was looking well for Jonah. He looked at his circumstances, and it seemed as if it was a definite green light. He fled, notice this, in doing this, he fled from the presence of the Lord. When we depart from him, we depart from communion. We depart from fellowship. We depart from the conscious, felt presence and smile of our Saviour. And he fled from the presence of the Lord. Now God is, is on omnipresent, 
And we cannot flee from his presence, as Psalm 139 is concerned, but we can, f we can flee from his felt presence. So he's on his way, and he goes on a boat as the reluctant, shall we say, disobedient prophet, and in the context of being in that boat, the Lord shows us, us his way of pursuing his servant and catching up with his servant and dealing with his servant and bringing him back. Do you remember, if I can find this, by Francis Thompson, the poem, The Hound of Heaven? I fled him down the nights and down the days I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears I hid from him. And under running laughter from those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, Deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat and a voice beat more instant than the feet. If things betray thee, who betrayest me? I won't go on. The hound of heaven is in pursuit of his servant, and Jonah is on the run, and Jonah suddenly finds things catch up with him. Which means that in the boat, the sea becomes a storm and the winds blow and there's the threat of the ship being destroyed and pagan sailors look at the servant with whom the servant has said, I'm on the run from the living God and they, out of kindness for this man, want to spare him. But in the end, as the lot shows that he is the man who is causing all the trouble, what are we to do with him? Jonah says, throw me into the sea. And into the sea he's thrown, where he is swallowed by a great fish. So from the deck of the sheep where he's sleeping, suddenly he's in this vault of a whale. And he can smell and see the seaweed and all that's been consumed by this well. And this is his prison. This is his death. This is his end. This is the obituary notice for Jonah. And in the place of desolation and darkness and disobedience, Jonah comes back. How do I know he comes back? Because he looks up to heaven and he begins to pray again. May I pause in the rush and tumble of life? where we are juggling all these balls and we find that other things have to go, including a felt, conscious walk of prayer and communion with the Lord. It's possible to be active and engaged, yet empty and dry and guilty because we have not been seeking the Lord who has brought us to himself. This book has a resonating ring. This book speaks. I am the man. As we look at Jonah. And in the belly of the fish as Jonah speaks. Asking for mercy and grace, that is in chapter 2. He finds that God is gracious to him once again. He'd been gracious to him before. Now he is gracious to him once again. And he causes the fish to vomit 
Jonah out onto the dry land and into clean air. And he hears his heartbeat. And he recognises as he feels his spiritual pulse that he's recovered a heart for the Lord. You see how God deals with his servants? He brings them into the place of darkness and desolation and death so that through those experiences Jonah might, re might experience life and the smile of God once again and the tenderness of God once again. The love of the Lord for Jonah. My child, my child, you thought you could run away from me with impunity, without cost? <coughs> when the Pharisees and the scribes probed Christ and said, give us evidence an authenticated proof that you are what you are, that you are the saviour of the world. Do you remember what the Lord said in Matthew 12? I'll give you one evidence, the sign of the prophet Jonah. What Jonah experienced in the belly of the fish was what Christ experienced in the belly of the earth. Jonah went down through his disobedience into the path of darkness and desolation and the end. And Christ, because of his voluntary willingness to take upon himself our sins, our disobedience, entered into a similar vault of darkness and desperation. and forgottenness by God in order that through that he might be brought to life. The seed is put into the ground and unless the seed is broken up and dies it will not bring forth any fruit. Do you see the purpose of God in sticking with Jonah? Here's a question. Don't answer it because I won't hear you. <laughs> Maybe that's good. But if Jonah had gone the first time and simply, reluctantly, mechanically given a message of judgment to the Ninevites, would anything have happened? I would suggest I don't think anything would have happened. But Jonah this time comes with the marks of the Lord upon him. Dealt with, chastened, having the sentence of death written upon himself and now brought to new life, having experienced the mercy of God. Where would I be without the mercy of God? Can you imagine him standing on the platform in the pulpit in Nineveh as he went to this city, 140,000, and preached the message, you must repent, judgment is coming. He was a man on fire. He was a man who had come face to face and experience with a God who had graciously dealt with him, who'd had mercy. And he could say from the heart, look, he's had mercy on me. He can have mercy on you. Paul says, isn't it, death works in us that you may have life through us. We don't condone the disobedience in our life or in Jonah's life. We are so grateful for his patient persistence with us that deals with us in kindness to bring us back.
and how we are changed, how we are thankful for those experiences in retrospect. We've been at the Aberystwyth Conference. Paul Mallard, who was at one time, I think, a pastor in Chippenham for a number of years, retired now, still writing books. And uh, he's written one or two books on suffering. And he was sharing how his wife, Edry, do you, know, do you know his wife? Do you know the couple I'm talking about? His wife is Edry. She's had MS for 30 years. She's in a wheelchair. She was there at the conference. And he had been praying that Edry would not go down this road. That she would be spared this, but she wasn't. And for 30 years, he's, he's been increasingly her carer. And he said in one of his messages last week, I'm so grateful for Edry. I'm so grateful, not that I'd wish this on her, that she has had this besetting infirmity. I would have not known the patience that I have known now with congregations and with people and with a sympathy that I've been able to have with people who are going through it in all kinds of ways simply because I've had under God's kindness, to look after my dear wife. So you trust him in everything, and you trust him for everything. By any means, by any route, he's able to bring us back. God knows the way to bring us back our fallen spirits to restore. Oh, for thy truth and mercy's sake, forgive and bid me sin no more. That's Jonah's testimony from the belly of the fish. Dark, dreadful, a sentence of death, series of experiences that was the making, the remaking of the man. And he goes round Nineveh preaching a message. Chapter 3. And it's a short message. It's not a long message. And it says, and it says, Jonah went round, verse 3, and he's told what to preach. Preach the message that I tell you. And Jonah arose, verse 3 of chapter 3, and went to Nineveh. And simply said in verse 4, So yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Going round Bristol, forty days. Two weeks' time. Clifton will be no more. Destruction is coming. One wonders, doesn't one, what effect this would have? Because COVID doesn't seem to have had much effect upon our nation. But here, under the power of God, a simple, I'm sure it was an expounded message, the whole city came under conviction. And what Jonah dreaded as we find from chapter 4, came to reality. They heard, they fasted, perhaps the Lord will have, have mercy upon us, and he did. Pagans, cruel pagans with a notorious reputation, the Assyrians, look at the life of the history of the children of Israel, and look what they did. And under this message, they came to a knowledge of the truth, the fear of God was like a tsunami that rolled itself wave upon wave over the whole city, the consciousness of the Holy One. 
what we need to pray for, isn't it? And God used a flawed man who became a restored man to proclaim a message that he didn't want to give, which was the means of the transformation spiritually of all the inhabitants. There's a wonderful description in the 1859 revival in Coleraine in Northern Ireland. And in 1859, these waves of the spirit of conviction came upon this city of Coleraine. And on a particular school, for example, a schoolboy, under deep conviction of sin, seemed so incapable of continuing his studies that the kindly teacher sent him home in the company of another boy already converted. He couldn't concentrate on his lessons because he was under conviction of sin. On the way home, the two boys noticed an empty house and entered it to pray. At last the unhappy, bo unhappy boy found peace and returned immediately to the classroom to tell his teacher, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I have the Lord Jesus in my heart. This innocent testimony had its effect on the class, whole class, and boy after boy slipped outside. The master, standing on something to look out of the window, observed the boys kneeling in prayer around the schoolyard, each one apart. The master was overcome, so he asked the converted schoolboy to comfort them. Soon the whole school was in a strange disorder. Oh, for such strange disorders amongst us. And the clergymen were sent for and remained all day dealing with seekers after peace, schoolboys, schoolgirls, teachers and parents and neighbours, the premises being thus occupied until 11 o'clock that night. Far too late for young boys and girls to be up. But in this case, we have to make an exception. Jonah, who became a man after God's heart, a preacher of righteousness. And the sequel, an enigma. I would have liked it to have ended at chapter 3, but there's chapter 4. And Jonah says, I knew you did this. I knew you would do this. Oh, dear. I wish I wasn't here. I wish and I hadn't been the means of proclaiming this message. What are we to make of that? After all God's kindness in restoring him, Do you remember the words of Augustine? I am an enigma to myself. Do you understand yourself? Do I understand my own heart? There seemed to be a sense of terrible, terrible, regretful anticlimax in the life of Jonah. I wish and I hadn't been used. And God shows kindness to him by providing him a plant, a good, under which he can sit in the heat of the day. And along comes a destructive worm and destroys the good and takes the umbrella-like covering away from his head so the sun beats on his head to remind Jonah that all that he is and all that he has been given is all by the grace of God. All by the grace of God. Jonah, haven't I right to give you that plant and then to take it away 
And haven't I the right as the God of all mercy to look at these Assyrians, bad, bad, bad though they are, and to say that there is forgiveness with me, that I may be known. Jonah, who are you to deny them what I have freely given to you? Why should you raise up an objection when you too are the recipient of the same mercy? And who are we to deny the gift of life as those who are the recipients of this life in Christ? Oh, for a heart that is like Christ's own heart. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you, but you were not willing. Aren't you here at Buckingham for this very reason, amongst others? To shed tears for the passers-by and to ask that the occasional visitors might be constrained to stay and make this their home or some other like-minded evangelical church. What are we for? What are we about? Aren't you grateful that the Lord will go to any lengths to make you what he wants you to be? If God did not spare his only son but gave him up freely for you and for me, Will he not also with your, his son give you everything you need even if it's the chastisement of his loving hand to bring you back so that you might be a Christ-like, gracious, winsome, God-like child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jonah has been given to you and me to equip you to be a child of God. <laughs> Make me more useful. Be kind to me. I'm no different. No different. Show me your grace. Lead me forward, whatever the cost, by any road, to be like him. Well, let's sing now as we close our time together this evening. 367. 367. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. And shall we forever live at this poor dying rate, our love so faint, so cold to thee, and thine to us so great? Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, come shed abroad the Saviour's love, and that shall kindle ours.
thank you for your word. We thank you that it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you for the way in which it sometimes searches our hearts and at the same time shows us the way everlasting. We thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ we have one who has staved us and the one who continues to restore our souls. You know us through and through. Oh Lord, you know our hearts. We want to serve you. We want to be more in fellowship with you. Show us the way. Grant us that increased desire of your Holy Spirit. And now may the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen.